OK, let's get stuck into the, the nitty gritties now. I'm just going to quickly share. Uh, my next screen, which hopefully now you can see. OK, so you can all see that now, please confirm. Yes, Oliver. Great, thank you. Good, so I'm going to run through, I think, just the RTMS requirements in detail and try and talk through the audit process and give you an understanding of what the requirements are before we go on time permitting to questions and answers, and then hopefully a few slides on the PBS or Smart Truck project. OK, so just to start off with, uh, the RTMS is a South African national standard. In fact, it's the only national standard that is specifically applicable to heavy goods and transport operations. Its um, content is reviewed by the SABS Technical Committee 241, um, and I'm a part of that committee, essentially to make sure that the content is constantly reviewed for suitability and um, that it is in fact applicable to the ever-changing uh, environment. So there are four main pillars to the RTMS standard. Loading control is obviously critical, um, then safety, you, you probably would have realized now from the video um, that road safety is a fundamental requirement of the RTMS standard, both in terms of safety of the actual vehicles, and then probably more of a challenge to most transporters is how do you operate those vehicles safely, which incorporates uh, driving behavior and, and monitoring of the vehicles, etc. Then the third pillar or core criteria is around driver wellness. And I think if we're honest with ourselves, it's an area which we as a country have severely neglected. And if you look at some of the, the situations and the high crashes we have in our country currently, um, people are suggesting and, and certain um, even reports are, are increasingly coming out suggesting that driver fatigue driver medical fitness is a key contributor to our very poor road safety record. And then the fourth pillar is around training, especially training of drivers, but also training other staff that have a role to play in promoting compliance and safety um, on the road networks. So RTMS is, is a management system. Um, those of you who are familiar with ISO management systems would understand exactly what the uh, the context is, but really speaking, any business, regardless of the size or um, complexity, will have some system in place, right, to manage the operations. What our team is, says is that, listen guys, let's look at what you do, transport, and let's pull together all of the different areas and put it together into a structured system so that you have some kind of a blueprint, some kind of a structured uh, processes that will help you manage your business and at the same time demonstrate how you comply with the requirements of the RTMS standard. And the little yellow shaded block at the bottom is quite important. RTMS is a system that requires self-regulation because it needs to be sustainable. So I know people get hung up about audits and about certificates and, and that's understandable, but I really would like to suggest that we think um, a bit more broadly about RTMS, because if you look at the road networks currently, the number of crashes, the number of unsafe vehicles out there, we know that law enforcement and government cannot mitigate these um, increasing risks. So it really is about good corporate governance. How can we as owners, as managers of businesses, help to promote the concept of self-regulation, where we're not looking for enforcement to hit us on the knuckles, but rather we're saying we will do all we can to identify our risk and then to comply, both to protect our own business, but also to protect other road users. And, and what often 
I find, especially amongst the smaller transporters, uh, is not fully appreciated is that with RTMS, it's actually helping you to build a system in to protect your business, to mitigate the risk and help you as a business owner or manager become more sustainable. So just coming back to the, the concept of self-regulation, so one would need to plan for your RTMS um, policies, procedures, and processes. So you'd look at, and in my next slide, I'll show you, what are the requirements of the standard? You'd look at what do you as a business currently already have in place? So you may already have you know, vehicle maintenance processes. You might likely already have payload management processes. Uh, you're sure to have uh, you know, invoicing systems that tie in your payload with your billing, et cetera. So look at what you currently have and then plan to implement procedures that may not be currently in place or that may not be fully addressing the requirements of the standard. And then obviously implementing is a, is, is a challenge, right? Developing a procedure or process is it's not that difficult. You know, you sit around a table, get a few people together and, and put it together. But how do you then implement the requirements day in and day out? Things like pre-trip vehicle inspections, uh, checking your inflation pressure of your tires, making sure the trucks and trailers are serviced. So the doing part is often the biggest challenge for companies seeking to go with RTMS. But having said that, um, the auditors and our team are very practical. We understand transport and it's it's almost impossible in my mind to be able to comply 100% of the time, right? So we are aware that there are practical considerations and as long as we can see that there are concerted effort, efforts and there's due diligence to implement the requirements, we will work with the, the businesses and the transporters to elevate the the performance of the road transport sector in South Africa. The third pillar of the standard, or rather, sorry, I beg your pardon, the third part of the concept of self-regulation is the need to check, monitor, and identify unacceptable risks. So if you've got a large number of trucks that perhaps are not being serviced as per the required intervals, that becomes a risk to your business, and to others, uh, you may have a situation where, where drivers are regularly exceeding the speed limits. That's again a risk. So the checking part is a key component of self-regulation and a key component of the RTMS. And the last part of that circle is the need to act. So where you find that there's been anomalies or non-conformances or some Thing that goes wrong. It's important to A, identify and then to take actions to mitigate those risks. And you'll see this kind of uh, philosophy is applicable to all parts of the RTMS standard as I'll, I'll talk you through it now. So they are currently in the in the standard, sorry, the, the typographical error there, it should be 2019. So it stands 1395-1 and it's the 2019 version. So there are 13 elements uh, in the standard, and then each element requires for there to be a specific protocol in place that you as a transport operator would implement in order to have the defined system we discussed and to be able to show that you have records to confirm that you are implementing the requirements consistently. So in my next uh, few slides, uh, I'd like to just summarize the, the main operational challenges that businesses have in implementing the RTMS and to explain those specifically how to comply with those requirements. So the first thing um, to know is that RTMS certification is issued per site. So if you're a business, and you have, let's say, four or five different um, operating depots, you could decide to obviously apply for RTMS for the entire five sites, or you could decide to choose a specific site or a specific contract. 
but what is important uh, to know is that once you've decided which contract or which site you're going to apply for certification, then all the vehicles on that site would need to constitute or be defined as part of your RTMS fleet inventory. So just remember at the end, once you have achieved certification, right, then each vehicle will get a yellow diamond um, confirming it's part of a certified uh, business. And you will also be uh, need will also need to display an RTMS license disk. So the first requirement is obviously to control all the fleet to ensure the licenses are valid. And then if you do have subbies um, that run for you, you could decide as an option to include them under your RTMS, but that is very much an optional at the discretion, sorry, at the discretion of, uh, of your business. Okay, loading control, a key requirement of the standard and one that often presents a challenge. Here the standard requires for there to be a clearly defined loading method per commodity transported. So if you've got, if you're transporting fuel, um, brake bulk, uh, mining aggregate, so for each commodity, you'll need to indicate in the form of a procedure or process, how do you load the truck, specifically indicating how do you comply with the relevant mass limits, both for the combination, as well as how do you make provision for complying with the individual axle masses. Let's say that the typical example on the screen of, of, a, of a combination and what the legal limits applicable uh, to the vehicle combination are. Obviously, we know that in our country, the maximum combination mass currently is 56 tons. Unless you are running uh, PBS or smart trucks, then you could potentially in that case um, go up to around 70 tons combination mass. But if you are running regulation or standard vehicles, the current limit is 56 tons. And of course, each axle or axle unit has a maximum legal limit. So when you are defining your loading method, um, you need to ensure that you can demonstrate that your method does comply with the legal limits for the specific combination. Now, many people ask, you know, do I need to have a way bridge on every single site I'm loading at, or do I need to have onboard loading, uh, or sorry, onboard load cells? And the answer is no. Obviously, physical weighing is ideal and first prize, but it's impossible for there to be a weigh bridge at every single loading site, and it's probably equally impossible for there to be onboard load cells on every truck. So physical weighing is first prize. It would be great if you have that facility, but you could then load using calculated methods. So if you're loading, for example, uh, pockets of cement, you could validate that each pocket of cement is 50 kilos and based on volume, you could then calculate the tonnage for that specific uh, trip. One could also load by volume. So the standard doesn't say you must have a scientific or equipment to indicate your, your payload or, or, or manage or load, but it must indicate your loading method must indicate that how do you calculate your maximum payload and how do you comply with it? If you are in the bulk a commodity sector, it's very typical for there to be a way bridge on each of the mines, for example. And here the standard will require for there to be a system where every single trip is monitored for the for payload and combination mass. And this data ought to be captured on a spreadsheet, like in the example on the screen. And here's what is also very important. So somebody should analyze your company loading data and to work out or calculate what is the percentage of trips overloaded. So currently the RTMS National Committee does permit, um, does permit due to practical uh, considerations, a maximum of 4% um, tolerance or leeway. So theoretically, for every 100 trips that one loads, you might have 
you could have four trips that were over the legal limit and still achieve certification. But that is very much the limit, which is 4%. So it's really important, A, to collate your, your payload data on a monthly basis, and then B, to analyze the data and to be able to show what is your current percentage overloads. From an assessment or audit point of view, the auditors will certainly ask you for your um, currently current monthly percentage overload. They'll go back and look at your, your spreadsheet, and from this spreadsheet, they will choose a few trips and request the source documents, be that um, Weybridge tickets or um, Waybills or other forms of um, of records that could confirm that the payload you've calculated is in fact the correct payload for the combination that's being used. And the idea obviously is to ensure that the overloading frequency is being minimized uh, month on month. So if you are in specialized um, transport sectors, such as in abnormal loads and even within abnormal loads, there are various specialized sectors such as mobile cranes, um, heavy uh, yellow equipment, car carriers, and others. So if you are in these specialized transport sectors, then you need to ensure that your safe loading method makes provision to say, for example, how would you load an ADT uh, onto your truck? How do you position the vehicle? Uh, if you're loading yellow equipment, where does the scoop lie? How do you distribute the load, etc.? At the bottom of your screen, that photograph is of a car carrier. And in this sector, I think one or two colleagues are from the sector, you would know the maximum height permitted is 4.3. But if you are RTMA certified, then you could load up to 4.6 height. So these are the kind of um, information that one would need to include within the safe loading method if you are in those sectors. Okay, before I go into the next um, next area, are there perhaps any questions or comments on on payload management and uh, and safe loading method? Any questions? Um, you can just shout or put up your hand before we continue. Okay, going once, twice. Okay, we're moving on. Then the next area in the RTMS is around um, safety and ensuring that all the safety parameters are complied with. Safe speed is a key requirement in the standard. We, we do know that in our country, and in fact worldwide, um, traveling at an unsafe speed is a leading cause of accidents, crashes, um, or collisions. So maintaining and ensuring the drivers are conscientized is a key requirement of the standard and part of the challenge that many transporters face. So what does the standard require? Firstly, the, there should be a speed policy in place, and the policy must promote driving at a safe speed. Now, many I think it's very um, often that people assume that the safe speed is in fact the road speed limit. And whilst that may be true under ideal conditions, it's very rare in our country that we do have ideal conditions, right? Especially with road construction, protest action, uh, congestion, weather conditions, etc. So it's really important that one promotes safe speed, taking into account all the variables that I've just mentioned. So here the standards required for there to be a policy in place. There should be a method or a process indicating how do you monitor your trucks for to ensure they're complying with the road speed, be it on the N3 or on the R103 or wherever it may be. And then how do you detect all speed violations and what actions does one take to mitigate any drivers that may be habitually exceeding the speed limit. So that's quite an important part of the standard. From an audit perspective, okay, before I go to that, that um, example on the screen is a typical speed policy. 
which one could consider to adopt, but of course the discretion is entirely up to each individual company. Um, perhaps I should have said at the beginning, RTMS, uh, the standard does not prescribe a one size fit all approach. So you would then have the discretion to decide in the context of your operation, how to define your speed policy and your payload management and, and, and et cetera. So the discretion is very much company specific and you certainly have a fair amount of, um, of parameters that you can decide how to compile your procedures. Then as I was saying, from an audit point of view, the auditor would typically request for a certain number of fleet vehicles, your telematics data for, for a month or two, or maybe longer, depending on how big the fleet is. And they will then look at the telematics data and assess if in fact the speed policy you have in place is being effectively implemented on a day-to-day -day basis. So in this example, you'd see it's quite a well-managed fleet with just some, um, any, uh, was there a question or a cough? Cough. Okay, uh, in this example, it's a fairly well-managed fleet with very minor deviations. Now, people often ask, at what point does the, the auditors become excited uh, and, and would raise a, a major non-conformance? That will depend on your policy, right? From a good practice point of view, if a truck goes up to 85 kilometers per hour in an 80 zone for a few seconds, we wouldn't expect for you to raise non-conformance every single time he went over for a second. Because sometimes for, for, for safety reasons, the driver may need to overtake quickly to get past, but those are the exceptions. So your policy will need to factor in those practical considerations. But certainly anything above 90 kilometers would most likely be deemed to be a non-conformance. So in your policy and speed policy determination, um, think about those kind of high risk behaviors and how do you factor that into a system where it, it does not require you to act on every single minor deviation, but rather analyze trends and, and there, thereby make it a more effective and more practical kind of um, monitoring system. Okay, monitoring and detection is important and then taking actions for anomalies. Okay, then the next area in the standard requires for there to be detailed accident investigation and analyses. This is mainly to understand if you're having a high number of incidents, um, if you're having a high number of incidents caused by human factors or are they due to technical issues, perhaps it might be the road infrastructure that's causing incidents or the weather. So in a lot of the time, uh, from experience, we've seen that drivers often seem to be the default um, cause of incidents. But I think it's really important, uh, colleagues, for us to take a objective look at other factors. Let's assume if you're finding a large number of incidents are happening during misty conditions or happening at early morning or late evening. So taking into account those factors helps you to understand what's happening, at what time of day is it, is it a specific season, and in that way enables one to have much more effective means of dealing with these, in, these incidents. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that's kind of what the, the goal of the standard is, to understand what are the leading causes of traffic incidents, and then to then implement appropriate um, counseling, retraining, or other methods to mitigate these behaviors. The same kind of an approach is applicable for traffic infringements or offenses. One is required to um, capture all the traffic fines that you get and to classify as to what are the major contributors and where needed, address it either with the technical people, your subcontracted technical uh, facility, or if the drivers are the ones that are causing the, the high number of fines, such as speeding, or overloading, then address it with them. But this is a requirement of the standard just to ensure and to validate 
that the traffic fines are not excessive and there is again an indicator that your performance is in fact complying with the expectations of the RTMS standard. So I know. Okay, it's not me, somebody else. Um, many of you would, but if you could please, yeah, thanks. Many of you would know that Arto has for now seemed to um, uh, hit a bit of a, a block and, and we're not sure when it would be implemented, if ever, but as it stands, if you are currently compliant with the RTMS standard, in other words, you're taking note of your fines, uh, you're mitigating um, by actions, then you are more than likely already having a system in place to mitigate ARTO. So if, if you are RTMS certified, ARTO will not likely present a huge challenge or the fear that well, that is there, I think, currently. But let's wait and see uh, what happens. We've heard from the um, from ARTIA, which is a division of the Department of Transport, that they've pretty much um, still have ARTO as part of their plans, but but who knows. Then the next area for the RTMS standard um, and the requirement is for there to be a defined vehicle maintenance plan in place where all the trucks are serviced according to a defined service interval. So one would need to, like the example on the screen, have a system where you can easily track which vehicles are due for a service and when are they due, and somebody then takes action to make sure that it happens as per the, the schedule. Of course, you know, sometimes the vehicles might be cross-border uh, and you may, you know, go over by 100 or 200 kilometers. That will not be an audit finding, but if there is, when the auditor looks at your, your trucks and your trailers, if he looks at, let's say, 10 trucks, and of the 10, he's found, say, four trucks that are constantly exceeding the intervals, then that would be deemed to be a, uh, a major finding or a major non-conformance. But if it's minor, infrequent, and of, of small extent, meaning it's marginally over the interval, then he will likely not raise the non-conformance, but rather just make a recommendation. So these are the kind of audit um, parameters that the auditors will apply when auditing your, your operations. Then in addition to the service schedule that you saw on the earlier slide, there would need to be service records, be it for the trucks or the trailers or mobile cranes or whatever other equipment you, you operate. Uh, similar to the one on screen, it might be a service record that you obtain from your third party provider, or it could be, in this case, a an in-house workshop that conducts trailer services. So it, the standard does not prescribe um, the actual format of the record. So we would look at whatever system you currently use, as long as your system can show that you do have um, a process that ensures the vehicles are serviced as per your defined intervals. Tires, uh, we know how important these are from a safety perspective. And here the standard requires for there to be a tire management system in place that clearly uh, indicates how are you checking your inflation pressure and your tread depth as well. So the standard says at least on a periodic frequency, which we would say at least every quarter, there ought to be an inf um, a tire survey done that we would look at the, the data to say what percentage of wheels are correctly inflated, what percentage are within optimal tread depth, et cetera. And of course, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, RTMS um, helps a business to run safely, but also productively. And we know there's a big link between uh, your correctly inflated tire pressure to fuel consumption, right? So if the vehicles, if the tires are underinflated, then it increases your rolling resistance, increases your fuel consumption, and obviously negatively um, affects your, your business profitability. So, and, and it's not just tire pressure, mind you, it's vehicle servicing that does have a direct impact on profitability in terms of reduced downtime, 
reduced breakdowns, reduced punctures, etc. So all of these fundamentals um, not only help you to be safer and to tick the compliance box, but it also helps one build in a proper foundation or framework to also minimize negative uh, productivity impacts and obviously negative um, impact on, on profitability as well. Then the standard also looks at as part of the road safety component, the need to have vehicle pre-trip inspections done. So if a truck is allowed to go onto a public road with a safety defect, it is a massive risk both to your own business, but also to other road users, right? So the vehicle must be checked and where there are safety critical defects noted, these ought to be repaired before the vehicle is allowed onto a road. So, so you can see in this case, if it's an A category uh, hazard, then the truck should not be used because of the um, of the potential high safety risk. If it's a B hazard, the truck can still be used with the repairs done on the next shift. And if it's a C hazard, meaning it's not that uh, safety critical, then the truck can be used um, and the repairs planned on the next planned maintenance interval. But of course, it's not always that cut and dried. If a structural damage, which in this case is deemed to be a C hazard, the question is, how bad is the damage? If it's just a hairline crack, perhaps, in a in a area where it's not crucial, it's possible to delay the repair. But if it's a major structural damage, then the truck should not be used. So it's important to train the drivers and your loading staff and your um, supervisory teams to be able to make these decisions and judgment calls because of the of the of the high risk associated with vehicles that may not be safe to to be on, on the roads. Driver wellness, as I have mentioned already, it's been an area which has been neglected by and large. And here the standard requires for there to be annual medical fitness certificates. So all the drivers of an RTMS fleet should be checked at least annually for, um, for fitness. And if there are drivers that perhaps have been diagnosed with chronic conditions, such as sugar diabetes or hypertension, uh, defective vision or, or other illnesses, such as you know, musculoskeletal illnesses, then these higher risk excuse me, these higher risk drivers ought to be managed with exceptional circumstances. So you'd need to say drivers with diabetes may, for example, need to go for more clinic visits, or we may need to have more training done, making these drivers who are diabetic and hypertensive of how important it is for them to take the medication, to get sufficient rest, um, to be able to understand the symptoms of the illnesses, and I'll talk a bit later on about that under the training requirements. Fatigue management, again, um, I might have mentioned this at previous sessions, but we've heard again from the Department of Transport that the number of single vehicle incidents uh, is increasing exponentially. In other words, trucks that are going off route, uh, for example, I think there's been like a 70 or 80 percent increase in the trucks going off the road between Heidelberg and Sedara on the N3 last year. And that clearly points to the fact that drivers fall asleep at the wheel or are fatigued and just you know lose their orientation. So here the RTMS standard requires for there to be a defined shift schedule that clearly indicates when are the drivers having their rest days allocated. And then specifically, for long distance driving. The system that one has in place should ensure that long distance drivers are monitored for continuous driving hours. And there should be, if for example, one is driving Durban to Cape Town, there should be um, safe resting stops indicated and a journey plan where the drivers understand exactly where they should stop for how long. So the journey is planned and structured and not left to the discretion of the driver who may be inclined to push himself longer than he can possibly probably tolerate. 
uh, driver competence or driver training as it's more commonly known. Here the standard requires for there to be planned training interventions at least annually uh, with some of the key safety and operational knowledge communicated things we've been mentioned we have mentioned already safe loading vehicle safety defensive driving fatigue driver wellness and other operational areas that are important for your business um, to, to function and i should say that the the driver training need not be purely academic so pulling drivers into a classroom and just lecturing isn't always the most effective means of communicating with the drivers. Rather, think about innovative ways of engaging with them. You know, at the briefing, debriefing sessions, during toolbox talks, informal meetings, um, showing them videos of accidents that have happened, uh, having posters up. So it, it doesn't need to be just an academic exercise, which often can be um, not effective, but rather integrate into your business, practical training, practical coaching, so it becomes something which isn't just a standalone, boring once a year event, but rather something which the drivers can see that the management team takes very seriously. Um, training content can be can vary depending on, on what you deem to be most appropriate, but certainly things like um, road signs should be covered because Every day we see drivers that either don't know what a specific road sign means or they just disregard it completely. So emphasizing these very fundamental aspects as part of your culture change, if I can call it that, is essential. This is a very um, commonly known uh, defensive driving um, um, uh, philosophy, which is commonly termed CEPIDE scan, identify, predict, decide, execute. So it trains the drivers when they are on the road. They should be scanning the environment constantly. They need to identify high risk um, uh, or potential high risk uh, maneuvers from other drivers or pedestrians or animals, predict how would they behave, decide what to do and then execute. So it's a system that is designed to keep the driver in a fairly constant state of focusing uh, and at the ready to respond if needs be, if needs be. <clears throat> I'm not sure if this will run, but I'll give it a try. This is a, a two, two uh, videos, one in the, in the next one showing these drivers who've fallen asleep and how this happens every single day on our roads. That's the one. Um, here's another. So, so both those gentlemen were extremely, extremely fortunate. The vast majority of drivers are not that lucky. Falling asleep at the wheel often would lead to a rollover, uh, depending, of course, on, on the geography around the area where it happens. But again, just to emphasize the point that the driver training program should emphasize fatigue management. Uh, I'm not going to go through this in too much detail because of time constraints, but all the signals for a driver to understand how does he interpret his own fatigue and what are some of the symptoms or signals uh, he needs to understand, he or she needs to understand what are the causes of fatigue and you know, lack of sleep. Um, okay, when a driver comes to work, to your operation at, let's say 5 a.m. or 6 a.m., you have absolutely no idea if he slept one hour or seven hours. You assume, because he's come to work at 6 a.m. or 5 a.m., that he's had sufficient sleep. Only that man or woman, when he comes to work, knows how does he feel, how much sleep he's had. 
So by training and creating an awareness of, for example, the need of adequate sleep, you educate the driver so that he knows, hey, listen, I got to have at least five, six hours sleep. Otherwise, I'm going to battle and I could be a risk to my own well-being. So this is the kind of training that is intended to be included in your refresher um, annual training, or even if it's a more sustained toolbox talk approach, or it's an innovative uh, video that you show, et cetera, uh, and how to combat fatigue. Uh, so this is just one example I've used on fatigue, but the same kind of um, approach one would need to apply to the other areas, you know, vehicle safety, payload management, tire checks, uh, defensive driving, etc. Okay. So finally, um, the RTMS standard also looks at some of some management functions that need to be uh, impl implemented, mainly relating to your performance indicators and the reporting thereof. There are around, I think it's eleven different KPIs that need to be reported on uh, on a quarterly basis via the website. This includes your overloading percentage, your number of crashes or crash rates, number of traffic fines, fatalities, uh, number of non-conformances issued for speeding, etc. So this is quite straightforward. It's purely numbers that one will need to input onto the, onto the website. Uh, you can use, either go to the RTMS website, which I'll show you now, or onto the JC Auditors website as well. The last bullet on that slide refers to internal audits or management review. So the entire RTMS standard, as I've mentioned at the outset, is self-regulation. So it is important for there to be an internal audit of your system uh, and for management, either the owner or the management team, to look at your performance and and see where are the areas that need improvement and where are the opportunities for improvement. From an audit point of view, you will not fail the audit if you have a high number of, um, of areas that need improvement, provided that the auditor can see, hey, listen, they are aware that these are the risks and these are the actions they are taking or plan to take. The, the idea from an audit point of view is not to penalize you or to fail or for you to fail the audit. No, it's rather to help you understand where, where are your risks and to enable you to, to implement measures to improve your performance and to be safer and, and more compliant. And, and all of the auditors in our team are transport people who've been in operations and have a really good um, appreciation of the challenges in the transport um, sector. That's the RTMS website, which, as I mentioned, you can input your quarterly data onto, or you could go onto the JC Auditors website. Both portals feed into the central database, uh, so you could choose which one you want to input into. So, in conclusion, um, that these are the the key requirements of the standard, just, um, represented by those icons, and policies, procedures, implementation, checking and obviously acting wherever there are anomalies that need further action. So that's just a, a summary of the first part of today's discussion, just confirming or explaining rather what the RTMS standard requires. And as you can see, the, the goal is to ensure that safety is prioritized and safety is achieved on, on our road networks. Okay, before I talk through the, the audit process, are there any questions or comments specifically on on the requirements? So we'll we'll give you a couple of minutes for that. If there are any questions before we we go into the audit process and before I talk you through that, colleagues, anyone? Okay, everyone. So Sorry, looking at... Oliver. Yes. Here. Hi, Jasmine. The book from uh, 10 to 11. What time is it supposed to? Oh, is it 11 now? Yeah, that's why I just I Goodness just gracious. Oh, my word. I think, I think we started late. Okay, my apologies. Well, I think I'll, okay, I didn't realize it. Sorry, my apologies. I'll run through quickly then the audit process if there are no uh, further questions. 
Thanks, Oliver. Okay, yeah, thank you for that, Jasmine. Good Lord, I must be getting old. Anyways, um, <laughs> so the audit, the audit process essentially, um, there's a stage one audit if you have not been certified yet. Stage one audit looks at your policies, procedures, and processes in place. If there are any gaps, the auditor will send will give you a report saying, "Listen, these are the four areas that you still need to address before the main audit is conducted." At the main audit, that's where the detailed evaluation takes place. The auditor will look at your trips, he'll look at your trucks or vehicles, uh, he will look at your driver staff, and request from that a sample um, telematics data, sample vehicle, maintenance history records, uh, payload information, driver training records, um, accident incident analysis, etc. So it's all based on a sample of, um, of vehicles, drivers, and trips chosen on the day of the audit, and you will then be given the chance to explain how your system works and to show the auditor evidence of your compliance. Um, yeah, so that is in a nutshell what the audit process entails, but I think, Ryan, if you wouldn't mind, just to share the uh, application form for especially those who are new to RTMS, and who are considering um, making an application to share the application form. And to also, Ryan, if you wouldn't mind to share the link. So if you want to book a one-on-one -on -one meeting, uh, Ryan will share a link. And if you click on that link, it will take you to our online calendar where you can book a meeting request and we can talk through your individual questions that, that you might have uh, related to your specific business operation. So again, my sincere apologies, I completely lost track of the time. Um, but I think we have covered and explained all the requirements in detail. So I think we, we should be good there. But like I said, if you do have any other questions, uh, Ryan will share the link in a minute on the chat. Click on the link, set up a meeting, and we'll gladly talk you through any specifics you may need assistance with. Um, yeah, so that brings us to... 11 o'clock on the dot. So despite my earlier mess up, I think we, we more or less covered. So colleagues, thank you again for joining. Uh, Ryan has shared the link. So if you have anything uh, or need any further assistance of whatever nature, if you want to talk about PBS, uh, smart trucks and performance space, you're welcome to drop us again an email and we can set up a meeting with you one on one and talk you through those requirements. Thanks, Sharon, for your nice comment. As always, a pleasure working with you as well. Great. So if they are, we'll, we'll hang around. Ryan and myself will be around for the next 15 minutes. So if you do want to stay back and ask a question or two, you're most welcome. Otherwise, a big thank you for joining. Uh, we hope you found it informative and helpful, and we look forward to any inquiries you may have going forward. Thank you very much, and have a lovely day further, colleagues. Take care. Thanks. Thanks, Oliver. Thanks, Ryan. Cheers, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Oliver. Most welcome, guys. Most welcome.